All right, nice. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Sergeant Sadichin. I'm uh, the organizer of uh, Rackham Workshop, Central Concepts in Contemporary Theory. Uh, and today we have the honor of having two very good friends of mine um, give uh, presentations on economy uh, and psychoanalysis. Uh, so first it's going to be Gabriel Tupanaba, who comes from, I was, uh, was doing a postdoc at the Pontifica Universidade Católica, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Perfect. Uh, he has a PhD under the supervision of Alenka Sopancic, and he's the co-author of Hegel Akonajizic. He's written at this point, I think, uh, well over a dozen articles on um, psychoanalysis, on politics, on Baju, Marx, Zizek, Hegel, Lacan. Uh, he's also one of the um, editors of Crisis Critique, uh, both the original Kosovo version and the newly established uh, South American version. Um, what else can I say? He's, um, he's going to be giving two papers today, the first, or today, one paper today and one paper tomorrow. The first paper is called Political Economy of the Future, and the second one is called The Future of Psychoanalysis. Uh, is there anything else I can say? I think I should at this point just get out of it. Oh, there's a, there's a book, a uh, forthcoming book from Duke and a forthcoming book from Bursa. There's one from Bursa and another from Small Brazilian. Ah, Small Bursa. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. All right, so there's one from a real publisher. One from and one from an imaginary, imaginary publisher. publisher. Yeah, you don't know <laughs> All right, so without any further ado, it's uh, my great pleasure to, to introduce Gabriel, a very good friend of mine, and I think somebody who probably has something positive to say. So, let's start. <laughs> So, uh, as, as he was saying, I'm going to talk about this very broad theme of political economy of the future. So, it's actually a, a funny thing because Dennis and I co-wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I was thinking about this earlier today, and it's funny because it was a book that I wrote a section on uh, psychoanalysis and politics, and he wrote a section on philosophy and time. And I think that it turned out that what we're doing today is kind of a continuation of that same, those same topics uh, in a different way. So today I'm going to focus more on the economic, economic part, Marxism, philosophy, of history, and this is doing more something that connects with psychoanalysis. And tomorrow we're inverting a bit the uh, part. But uh, what I think it's important to, to explain a bit is the, let's say, the motivation be behind this research because Usually, I think that this sort of interdisciplinary studies they can be a bit. Uh, sometimes it's hard to know if we have a clear problem behind, like motivating these crossovers. And when you don't know exactly what you're aiming for, it's very hard to keep a rigorous conceptual framework. Sometimes you need to distort concepts a lot to go from one place to the other. Suddenly, you're saying that money has an unconscious and that, you know, you know Family is, in fact, a source of surplus value, and you change everything just to fit together. So it's very good to know a bit what sort of problematics is actually driving sort of research, otherwise it gets, gets a bit uh, confusing. So I wanted to start by telling you guys why I'm taking you, you'll see, it's such a long detour uh, to get to the, the problem. Because I'm a psychoanalyst in Brazil, and psychoanalysis is not a well, a Brazilian or a Latin American enterprise. It's a, either a European, uh, either an Austrian or a French enterprise, if you are like me, uh, connected with Jacques Lacan and Lacan and Psychoanalysis. So, how do you bring this to Brazil? And what are the things that change when you bring it to such a different historical context and economic context? And what, what needs to be changed so that you can continue to do psychoanalysis, if at all? So. When I, my interest is understanding exactly what are the, how should we read social and economic determinants, determinants so that we can then inquire if psychoanalysis is still viable in a different context. What, what should it do to adapt to that new context? Uh, because uh, in Brazil, for example, in a very specific case is that analysis tends to be an elite practice for people who have a lot of money, basically live like French people. So you get there, you see that there is a subculture that has access to this sort of treatment, and it's not simply because of the money, because if you try to expand it, that the people you're listening to actually 
lie on the couch and speak about their lives. They're speaking about lives that are only possible or sometimes yeah, practically impossible. In Brazil, it's very particular and sometimes catastrophic scenario we have. It's hard to know if that's something that one can listen to as an analyst or if you're just kind of uh, summoned to occupy a different position with regards to this, what they are saying, what's going on. Uh, so is it possible to have Brazilian psychoanalysis and Latin American psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis in popularized and precarious conditions that interest me a lot. So the idea today is to construct a couple of tools, uh, very broad conceptual tools, connected with uh, some Marxist ideas, some ideas that are that spring from uh, philosophy of history, some ideas that spring from uh, theory of history, for example, Heinrich Kozelek's work, Grodel, Wallerstein, uh, so that we can construct some concepts we can then use to question, if, okay, does this idea of psychoanalysis, and it's, the way it frames its own practice, does this make sense if certain things change? So basically what I want to do today is talk about, to construct these tools, uh, and I think that uh, I focus on the problem of temporality, so the, the question of future, present, and past, because even in the common sense, at least we know that Supposed even in all movies about psychoanalysis, when there is some analysts, they're supposed to lay down the couch and speak about the past. Like, what happened when you were a kid? Like, what's up with your mother? And those sort of things. So, uh, analysis seems to be something that drives you the, from the past back to the present. Or, or so you have a problem in the present and the past holds the explanation. Something like that, right? Uh, but psychoanalysis has a very, very hard and implicit concept uh, of future, how, how it prepares you to deal with new things that are coming on. And this is connected, I believe, with uh, the future of psychoanalysis itself. So what I wanted to do today is talk, about, talk to you about something that some critical thinkers are recognizing as a general tendency in the world, and especially in developing in the developed countries. Uh, concerning uh, the role of expectations of the future. I wanted to then develop some tools with, with, in a field called the semantics of historical time, developed by this very important uh, theoretician called Heinrich Kozele, in a book called Future's Past, to, to talk about how do we mean, how do we signify the experience of stories, how do we experience the, the historical uh, time, temporality, then try to move from this more, not psychological, but discussion of signification of how we understand what's coming in the future and things like this, to the question of what, what determines this. What is the basis, the economic, social base that determines how we're going to experience the future uh, in a certain context, right? With, so with, that, with those tools, we can then ask, okay, changing those conditions, won't our experience of time, of future, of history change a bit? And if psychoanalysis has such an important place for ideas of past, present, and future, then we can ask, okay, but will these ideas still hold in a, in a place where the future doesn't look the same as it did in 1970s France or Austria in the 20s, something like this? So that's the idea, to construct some tools that allow us to talk about the determinations of the experience of temporality and history in a given context. It's very broad, uh, so it goes between philosophy, political theory a bit, a bit vague in that sense. Uh, as a methodological point, I'll let you guys know that I speak a lot. It's not uh, compulsion to speak, so if you have any questions, better than interrupt me and we get a discussion going as I go along and I adapt it to what you guys want, want me to focus on and so on, rather than wait for a question at the end. And also, I tend to bring a lot of information down. It's a bit convoluted. Just pick up what you think is important and... Uh, yeah, I already have a question. Shit. <laughs> 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 Uh, so you, you, interestingly, you chose semantics to be associated with historical time and syntax with political subjectivity, but it isn't the intuitive uh, idea of semantics more belonging to subjectivity in the sense of like human meaning or? <coughs> Good question. Yeah. You can wait for next chapters of keep the mystery. <laughs> okay, we'll keep it. Otherwise, I'll have to go through all the slides. And, like, okay, you'll talk about it. Yeah, that's the whole. Okay. Whole team, I guess. 
Uh, but yes, that was well, a good way of putting the, the problem of today. Uh, yeah, because the whole thing, I mean, psychoanalysis does exactly this. We don't associate subjectivity with semantics. We associate subjectivity with syntax, for example. For Lacan in psychoanalysis, you go to the clinic, like I have a patient who's lying on the couch. The guy starts talking about his day. Well, you know, I woke up today, I went to the bakery, I ate something, then I got coffee, went to the university, didn't that happen? I'm not listening to what, he's, what he means by what he's saying. I listen to the words that he uses and how he uses them. So I'm not really interested in the meaning that he ascribes to his experiences. Analysis happens by trying to extract the inner logic of the grammar of how you speak. So of course you're going to mean many things, but how do you mean them? That's where you loca locate subjectivity for psychoanalysis. So you need to have that both structures together to understand subjectivity for, uh, for psychoanalysis. I'll explain this in more detail. In fact, a lot of context uh, uh, concepts that might be a bit obscure today concerning psychoanalysis, I, I want that actually to get to know if you guys understand how you view this, if you have some knowledge of what all of this means, so that for the next lecture I can introduce the concepts very, in a very definite way. Uh, since I'll be speaking more specifically about psychoanalysis, then I can do this more uh, strict introduction. So tomorrow my idea is to talk about having all these concepts, I'll talk about the challenges of psychoanalysis, talk about how we think temporalities of past, present, and future in psychoanalysis, what the role we give to the history of a particular analysis, how we understand this, and then talk about, okay, in view of everything we said, and we, this, if these transformations I'm going to propose to you today make any sense. These are then the challenges we, should, we are facing today if we're interested in continuing this practice today. Uh, so that's it. So the first thing then is to understand, I, I, I decided to, to, to locate let's say, the, the challenges or, or to start thinking about the concepts that we need to produce or we need to have in mind in order to address the situation through the problem that I call the age of diminishing expectations. It's actually a title that a subtitle of a book by the Christopher Lash guy. Uh, Culture of narcissism, American life in an age of diminishing expectations. Uh, he had a very particular idea of what diminishing expectations meant, and it's interesting to to consider that he he uh, in '79. So he would write something like, uh, he was talking about what he thought was changing from the experience of the 60s to the 70s. He talks about even the sort of revolutionary experience of I don't know, the, the weatherman and things. And he said, well, even though they have some sort of vision of the future, you can see that that vision changed somehow. It's somehow connected with personal problems, personal liberty in a different way. So even those who still want to speak about the future in some meaningful way, they're speaking differently about it. And then he concludes this first introductory chapter by saying that uh, to live for the moment is the prevailing passion, to live for yourself, not for your predecessor or posterity. We are fast losing the sense of historical continuity, the sense of belonging uh, to a succession of generations originating in the past and stretching into the future. So we have this feeling that some sort of discontinuity, it's harder to locate exactly how you relate to what's coming afterwards, so the tendency is that to diminish. So the space or the horizon, as I will propose, where you place what the future is, where, how far from you the future is, how far ahead can you see, and what do you see when you look that far ahead? This, the answer to these questions are starting to change in a noticeable way from the 70s on. So, uh, he's a guy who made some, uh, uh, one of the first, perhaps, and no wonder that he, he, he proposed this term, the subtitle for his book, uh, he was one of the first to locate a certain disacceleration or a certain contraction of the horizon of where we expect things to happen and what sort of things we expect to happen. Uh, to give a, uh, just a brief example of the sort of question that entails and how this might produce certain phenomena, there is this famous uh, critical theorist called Frederick Jameson who has this kind of quip that it's, today is hard, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. What is he talking about when he said that? He's talking about a certain quality of imagination. Think. It's not that you don't want to imagine something new, but the tendency is that when you try to imagine it concretely, you posit it, you imagine it with certain, in a certain way, and that way it tends to be more about dystopias, catastrophes, 
uh, then about a new order of some sort, right? So why is that? How, what led us to this transformation? So at you, for example, in 1977, so around the same time, in a book called Speed and Politics, this uh, other theoretician called Paul Virillo, he started discussing the same transformation, but you can see that his wager was not so much connected with a sort of psychological transformation, not a matter of narcissism or a matter of uh, uh, perception. It was a matter of logistics. The logistics of the world is changing. The role of information is changing. And he gave a bit of a very brief explanation, but which connected to the, whose outcome was that our experience of historical time will change. So, for example, he quotes this uh, Andrew Stratton guy who talks about automation and says, well, when you automate things, it's not that you're removing human error from, from the equation, but you're moving them to the planning stage, where you're now, you might plan things wrong. And when you automate them, some error might appear. But you're not, er error is not being committed at the moment of the action. It's committed in the moment of the plan. So, he says, this changes our experience of how you deal with accidents when they happen. Because you cannot say that you were the cause of the accident. You just respond to it. So there's, in this quote, he just says a bit of this. He says, uh, so Virilo quotes him, we commonly believe that automation suppresses the possibility of human error. In fact, it transfers that possibility from the action stage to the conception stage. We are now reaching the point where the possibilities of an accident during the critical minutes of a plane landing, if guided automatically, are fewer than if a pilot is controlling it. You might wonder if you will ever reach the stage of automatically controlled nuclear weapons in which the margin of error would be less than with a human decision. But the possibility of this progress, progress threatens to reduce to little or nothing the time for human decisions to intervene in the system. So it's funny, the same that, thing that lowers the margin of error of a system in, decreases also the role of human decision, of human response to the thing. So it, if an accident happens, it's not a small accident, it's a catastrophe because you can never be prepared for something that is never that is not going wrong at the moment that you act. It's going wrong at the moment that it was planned. So there is sort of mismeasure between response time and what can happen. So the quality of accidents change. And Virilo says, well, contraction in time, disappearance of territorial space after that of the fortified city in armor leads to a situation in which the notions of before and after designate only the future and the past in a form of war that causes the present to disappear in the instantaneousness of decision. This European guy can understand why this language sounds so... You need to imagine a French accent and suddenly it sounds more profound. <laughs> but the idea is that somehow the, that relation between before and after, I made a mistake, I need to correct it. I, something might go wrong, I need to be able to answer. Suddenly, this is the, the moment of error is infinitely in the past. The catastrophe will affect the future forever and the present is no time to act at all, right? When he, he gives this extrapolating example of nuclear weapons that are automated, it's nobody made that decision. It's made in an algorithm somewhere, so that might have been a bad algorithm, it might be horrible. But if it ever goes wrong, you can ever never answer to it. So that's how a notion of a catastrophic point, tipping point, could be thought of. I mean, like that uh, Doctor Strange book. Well, Dr. Strindler is a good... When was that shot? Yeah, you know, I love it. It was 1977. Yeah, it was like the 50s. But it's a cool movie. Oh my god, we're terrible people. Please help us with that. That would be nice. Uh, another guy talking about the same period, but not writing from within that period. Uh, 64. 64. Okay, it's in the... We can live with that. Uh, another guy called Franco Berardi, uh, he wrote a book more recently, but recall, reminiscing on his experiences of the 70s, where he develops the idea that, well, somehow between the 70s and the 80s, the idea of future was no longer an effective idea. Of course, and he says, uh, the idea of the future has disappeared. It's not, the, to, to say this is not to say, of course, that there is no future, right? Uh, it's not to say that the future hasn't stopped unfolding. But when I say future, I'm not referring to the direction of time. I'm thinking rather of the psychological perception which emerged in the future cultural situation of progressive modernity, 
the cultural expectation that were fab that were fabricated during the long period of modern civilization, which he speaks in the years after the Second World War. So he suggests that there is actually something of an expectation or a form of expectation we call the future, which appeared with modernity, had its tipping point at the Second World War, and after that, this idea kind of contracts until it has no actual meaning. So it's funny that you see that this this guy here is actually associating it with what Virilo also associated with nuclear war. Uh, but he brings it to this level of perception again. Why is this important? Because what interests me, and I would like to get you guys interested in this problem as well, is, okay, let's say that it's true, that today when we speak about the future, we don't hail people and don't excite people the way that we did other times, or that uh, what we mean by future, what we, the expectations we place in the idea of future, they have a, actually a different quality than they had in the past. But what needs to change for those things to change? And is this change totally subjective in the sense that, well, all the means to make this concept effective again are here. It's just that we are, I don't know, in some sort of ideological trance. We're, we're still mourning what happened in the 20th century one of the most violent centuries I can imagine. Uh, so is it a more, more of a psychological or subjective thing? Or is there an objective basis no longer to count with the idea of the future? So, for example, a guy like Walter Benjamin would suggest that, well, there's an objective basis. We now know that the very pro what we call progress is actually a progress towards barbarism. It's not progress towards abundance. So you should pull the brakes. Not because we're psychologically uh, melancholic about the future, we're kind of not really in the mood for the future anymore, but actually because if we go towards the future in, this, in the way that civilization conceived of the future, through a certain movement of progress, of development, the actual result of this will be the destruction of everything. So for him, it was an objective problem with subjective effects. So he said we need to look at social economic factors to understand why uh, uh, the future is not such a bright idea anymore. Others, like Bifo, tend to put it more on the subjective side, at least at first. This guy here, uh, uh, Berardi, the guy that just quoted, he actually suggests at some point, he had to change his position, says we, don't, we cannot use this idea anymore. It's not politically relevant. But it, it's not hard to see how different the world looks when you take that idea of the equation, especially for people involved in political activity. For example, I'm part of a political organization. Evidently, we work together, but it's not like we're, everyone loves each other all the time. So you get into fights and you just disagree. When you disagree, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, there will be a future moment where things will be redeemed or some other thing will appear that will redeem the sort of renouncing that I'm doing now. Or, for example, I've our political activity requires us to, to move away from our houses, to go to other places very far away, sometimes dangerous, things like this. How do you account, how do you rationalize that renunciation of your free time, of job opportunities, of you know, a certain standing in your community? You, you let some of those things go. But you imagine that what you're losing, some gain comes from it. Normally, that gain is associated for people involved with emancipatory politics. That gain is associated, that this was for a very long time, with the idea that in a not so distant future, some change would happen that would justify retroactively all that I lost. So, if you don't have a place in the future to posit that you'll be redeemed in the things you lost, why would you engage in losing something like this? You know, why would you accept that cost? It's harder to accept that cost. That's a very concrete tactical problem. How do, how do you rally people around an activity, which, because it's collective, requires us to put aside some personal preferences, put aside some differences, you know, kind of have some conviviality with that guy you think it's just a push, you know, and go with him and be confused with him. He's the guy who takes the mic, says things, and you say, oh my God, that's so stupid. But in the future, this will be redeemed, right? But if you don't have that, why would you do this thing? How do we do economically organize the cost of losing something in the present for the sake of something that's going to happen in the future. So even if there is no, let's say, even if we're not 
politically affiliated with this field, which is indifferent to me. The question is, how do you square the equation? How do you organize that? It's a matter of concrete practical organization. How are you going to economically explain to yourself, and this is not economy necessarily in the financial sense, normally for politics it's not, hopefully it's not, if you're I'm going to lose some money here, but you know politics is going to help me make a lot of money. Perhaps it's not the best way to do it, or not always the best way to do it, though I'm not sure it's not a, it's a problem. Uh, but at least in some sort of what Freud would call libidinal, like you're really attached to certain things. You're letting go of that attachment. You'd like to be seen as a very uh, just person, and you're having to associate yourself with not so just people in your eyes. So you're being seen in a way that you don't like, and you're saying that this is okay because in the future, I'm going to gain something from this, or we all going to gain something from this. So how do we square this thing? So depending on where we posit the problem of the future, we can say that, well, we can still hold on, it will still deposit something in the future. It's just that we're not finding the right idea of the future. We're not promising the right thing. If you find the right promise that is materially possible, concretely possible, people will again accept to renounce certain things because they will gain them in the future. Or you can say, this is no longer possible at all. That we cannot, we can almost like structurally not put anything in the future that will convince people. In Brazil we're experiencing this a lot. And I have the slight impression that perhaps there's some resonance with other countries at this point. Politicians that don't already do something outside of the political sphere that can give the substrate of their prom serve as a substrate for their promises. So for example, we have a candidate in Rio who won the election. Uh, who is a, a pastor pastor in a church. A pastor. Yeah, so he's a pastor in a church. The, the church does a lot of community work. Uh, it has takes money from the people but also does things with the communities where they are. It's a huge massive thing. So when he goes to tell to be in the debates and says that uh, we were gonna we're gonna bring more jobs, we're gonna take people out of alcoholism and things like this, he already does this. He's not promising that he will do this in the future. He does it outside of political sphere. So people, he has an efficacy in this discourse that a leftist politician saying that they're going to create a better society in Rio, lower the crime rate, that doesn't convince anyone of that. Even though his proposals make more sense for the population in the sense of they do look out for most people's interests in some sense. So why does that guy have more efficacy in this discourse than this guy? Well, this guy depends on the idea that you can expect something from the future. By this guy's kind of putting his money on the things that he's doing right now. Saying, look, this is what I'm doing now. This, this present will last forever, let's say. Right. Slightly different logic, so this course. So this is another way of understanding what we can take from this whole debate. What is this infrastructure, the socioeconomic infrastructure, which uh, endows a discourse with a certain Way, effective ways of saying things and other the ways of lose effectivity. So if in the 70s in Brazil you were to say, let's get together because if I get elected I'm going to do this and this and this, everyone would go along. Finally a guy who has a vision of the future is going to do this and do that. This guy, well, if this guy is still around, <laughs> this guy in fact is called Lula, if he tries to do this now, he doesn't even have a political program anymore. He knows he doesn't need to do something changed. So how did it change? How, what, what is defined? So the first thing, uh, the first hint I think we have of how to approach this, uh, at least it interests me a lot, is this book called Futures Past by Zekel Kozelek. If you're interested, I, can, I forgot to write his name in the, I don't know, I think we have it. Uh, he developed a couple of concepts that are not really concepts of philosophy, but they're concepts to help us think what, it, what is an ex uh, historical experience of time. So, or how do we experience history? That's what it interests me. So he says, well, he begins his book with a really beautiful idea. Uh, he quotes a, a letter of, a, 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 I don't remember who was a, the, the philosopher or thinker who went to see a painting in a museum in the 16, 1700s, a painting that was painted in the 1500s. And the painting was a war, was the depiction of a war. 
that mixed elements from Alexand Alexander the Great, some of his battles, with a more recent event in the 1500s concerning Germany. So you had 1500 connecting to Alexander the Great in the painting, and there was a guy in the 1700s looking at that painting. And this guy in the 1700s, he wrote a little commentary, and he said that he felt so far away from the painting, in a way that the painter evidently didn't feel from Alex Alexander the Great. He felt like he could talk about his present by mentioning Alexander, Alexander's battle. So he felt like that past is very close to my present. And this guy in the 1700s was looking at the painting and saying, man, this, this belongs to another age. So something changed in that between, right? So what Kozalek tries to do is construct concepts that help us to understand what's going on in that sort of situation. And he develops two big concepts. One is this concept of space of experience, which is how he understands that the past is inscribed in the present. So things we experience already and the way that this is uh, absorbed by literature, different writings, and so on. Uh, that how families pass on. You no, know, this happened and this happened. It leads to a certain way we understand our own experience and compare it to the experience of whoever came before. And he calls the horizon of expectations this sort of way we anticipate the future into the present. So how do you think, locate, and, and, and retroject, not project, but bring to the present what you think the future holds? And he makes this distinction. It's not a very uh, novative distinction in itself between pre-modern and modern times in Western societies by saying that, well, before some, something or some ser series of events, we used to relate the future as something which is kind of containing the past. So for example, the idea of destiny, the idea of, uh, you, you see this a lot in the Roman world where before a battle, you would study battles from the past so you can understand how to better prepare for what's coming in the future. Knowing the history of your people, knowing the history of your culture, wasn't a way of keeping an archive, it was a way of preparing for the future. The future holds something that already is inscribed in the past in some way. It's more of, not more of the same because the past is also enigmatic. So when the future is enigmatic, that's actually what connects it to the past. We have a sort of, for example, mythology of how the world was created, or how our culture was created, so it has some mystery to it. So when mysteries happen, normally it's a sign of that old mystery returning. So it's a more of a cyclical concept of time, where we can say that the, the past teaches us what to expect about the future. Now, for Kozelek, what constitutes the modern experience, which is actually not an event that breaks the world in two, but something that was in the making for hundreds and hundreds of year, years, is the break in this. And if you open, for example, uh, the first, first chapter of a book by a guy called Hegel, and you read uh, the book of the introduction to the philosophy of history, you say, well, I'm going to read about something that, you know, historical development, what history all about for this philosopher. And he says, well, History only teaches one thing, which is that we cannot learn anything from history. So everything we can actually have from experiences of the past is that it teaches nothing about what's going on in the future. And if you read all about these guys who studied the battles of their ancestors, they also lost the battle. So like, it actually never worked. That's what we learned from history. So it's funny that what changed so that a philosopher from the 1800s could say that we cannot learn anything from history. And the idea is that somehow the, fu the future no longer holds that mystical core or, or, the, or this enigmatic core of the past. So that what's indeterminate about the future is not the sort of transcendental dimension of humanity. It's things we haven't experienced yet. We might not know what they are, but the idea that they are still to be experienced is now thinkable. So the future is open in a certain sense. That's why, for example, you get a very classic Marxist statement from the 18th of Brumaire, of Louis Bonaparte, when Marx says, well, people make history, but they don't make it the way they want it. So you inherit the conditions, the space of experience, but not to, not, in those conditions is not to contain what comes after, but they are the stuff out of which you need to make what comes after. So that idea that the future is now open, it's a matter of responsibility, it's a social question. What, what are we going to do with our own society? That's not a perennial question. That's a historically determined question. It's not a question for all societies. Perhaps it's not even a question for us today, but it was 
very strong question that appeared at some point. Uh, so, Kozelek helps us to define this and says, look, the horizon of expectation was qualitatively changed the moment that it's no longer coinciding with the borders of our experience. We cannot say that the borders of what we can experience, our space of experience, they are what teaches us about what we can expect for the future. And those things are beyond experience. So the net that this kind of religious dimension, for example, it's also what is enigmatic about the future. So this the question of where we came from and where we're going, they're answered by the same discipline, which is theology. In the modern world, we have many disciplines to talk about the past. We are different from the disciplines we try to talk about the future. So all of this so we can derive from the idea that some sort of break and a sort of more periodical notion of history appeared. But, right, you have a sequence, you have another sequence, and you have another sequence after that. You cannot say you have a sequence and the end of this sequence, which is the end of the world, connects with the beginning of the world, and the question of the creation of the world leads to, to both questions. So we went from a kind of a circle, just break this here and open it like this, right? <coughs> uh, it's interesting that, again, this break is actually, no wonder that to understand, for example, the Christian theology, but not only Christian theology, uh, but there's a good example of how suddenly rebellions that were concerned with taking the idea of a, a better afterlife and, and realizing it as justice in the world, which perhaps, for example, a 500-year-old celebration of Luther, very much connected with this idea. Somehow, the very concept of otherworldly justice was seeped into the world, and now we don't want to wait until we're dead so we get a better life. We want this to happen here. So it's funny that religion was the thing that actually allowed us to make that mediation into the world. Uh, so Kozelek helps us to, to see that there, we can call about the ho talk about the horizon of expectations as that concept that will pose the questions of what do you expect for this open future? What do you think are the handles on the present that you need to be holding on to them or changing them so that the future is changing this way or that way. We're going to get to how uh, in the future, next slides I'm going to talk about this a bit more because we see for example the idea that political economy uh, appears with the physiocrats and then with the classic uh, political economists like Smith, Ricardo, they're basically an answer to this. If you take care of political economy, you're directing what happens in the future. That's that's where the, the buttons are that you twitch here and there and that gets you one way or another way, right? That's the material basis for the future. Other thinkers had other ideas. Rousseau would say that the political will is this. We need to politically will the future. The problem of how to represent our expectations of the future would be the essential political problem. Representative democracy is directly connected with this. How are we going to count the will of the people to direct a government that represents people's expectations of the future. It's not mere an error of conservation. If you were just to conserve the society, we need those things to think about in that way. We need just a, I'll call it a custom support system. Customer support. Uh, so, other two concepts that I think we can introduce in here, and it's clear that it only makes sense within this particular context. And no wonder that Moore's utopia appears exactly in this moment. Uh, is the idea that only when this break appears, only it's no longer, let's say, metaphysically guaranteed that the future and the past form a certain circle, that you can ask, okay, if the future is open and could be different, when it's not being different, when we're repeating the past, what are we doing? Right? So the idea of ideology starts to appear there. The idea that we can look at the past, talk about the past as if it was not the past, but we're still in a certain circular sense, it's actually the, the, what will determine the future. We talk about the future in terms of the past, more of the past. That would be the idea of reproduction, right? We reproduce the current conditions as if they are necessary conditions. So these things will not change in the future. So the question of ideology has always been a question of what can change, right? If this is necessary. Human nature is this way. Humans are political animals. We need to live this way. Or, no, this is contingent. This could be different. So, Ideological debate has always sur been surrounded by this sort of question. On the other hand, you have also the, uh, the question of how do you imagine another future? If you want to anticipate something different, how do you do it? 
what does it mean to do that? It's not necessarily, doesn't mean that you know how to get there. Right? The future is open. If you know exactly how you're going to get somewhere, it's not exactly open. It's like you have the map and you know the street and you just walk there. So how do you map the future? So the idea that you need to put expectations that you have of the future somewhere that are it's not given in the present. I don't have the, the present. In the present, I don't have the map of it. That's what we call utopia, place that is not anywhere. Right? It's not anywhere. The place because it's not a place. It's a place in time, not a place in space. So uh, this guy called Karl Mannheim, in this book, he gives this definition where ideology has to do with the projection into the future of current values, since current values are based on the past. In a certain sense, it's a projection of the past towards the future. And utopia is a problem of how you project expectations, how you conceive of expectations, which the present gives you no uh, reason to believe in. Like, there's no, nothing in the present that tells you that the future is going to be like that. But since the future is open, nothing prevents you from imagining Alien invasions, or uh, like Bogdanov did, imagine a human colony in Mars in 1920, you know, things like this. So, utopia is how do you construct an appropriate place, what sort of grammar you need to construct to absorb the expectations that people have in a given moment in time about the openness of the future. So, we have there, I think it's important to see that there, there is a material, or, or there is at least some conditions, not material necessarily, but some conditions for the problem of, is the future going to reproduce what we already know? Or is the future going to be different from what we know? What sort of new experiences that were never experienced are possible for the future? Those questions are only properly posable the moment that this sort of periodical notion of the future, not of, the, of time, and not this closed notion of history where the future only holds what the past of history already both, that's only when it becomes possible for us to ask those questions. So this is so much for the semantics. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a change here in how we signify what history means. Before, history meant, you know, have expectations that the best place to mean the future is looking by the past. The, signif this, the meaning of the future is given by the meaning of our experience. We went through this and that, this is what our people is like, so that. <laughs> more of that for, for the future. Now, the modern experience is the Monty Python experience of, and now for something completely different. <laughs> That's the idea we have now of the future, or had of the future. So we mean the future we, between in this conflict between utopia and ideology. How are you going to signify this open place? What are you going to put there? More of the same or something new which doesn't really have necessary bearing on reality? As we will see, one of, let's say, the great uh, contributions or the proposals that Marxism had was to say, I don't need to be trapped in this duality. Either the, parent, the present allowed me to extend the present towards the future and what we have now is what we'll always have in some sense, or I need to have un unreal expectations of the future because the present is filled with contradictions. And parts of those contradictions, if you, if you extend part of this to the future, you get one future. If you extend another part of it, you get another future. So he tried to find something which is not utopian socialism, right? Utopian socialism which needs to project something which there has no real basis to lead us there, but to well, what Engels called scientific socialism, so an analysis of the present that actually finds in the present something we could hold on to and wager that they, this thing can lead you to a different future, right? Find a difference in the present rather than... So just talking for now as how we mean uh, what, uh, yeah, how we mean the future. So what I wanted to move a bit, and now I'm going to go, I'm not sure, I have about one hour, as I said, please interrupt me if you guys think I'm going too fast or doing anything too crazy, but uh, you'll see why I'm, I'm worried about the time, because I'm going to go into a big uh, movie trailer of history. Right? <laughs> but uh, you'll see. Uh, but so if we try to move to something slightly different now, which is, OK, so this is how we mean the future in modernity. We mean it by the debate about the present. In some sense. But what, is, what are the material, where, what is the thing in the present that we say, this is the determining thing. So what is, one thing is to say the future is significant. It's, we, we are going to locate in the future, locate the present, and then we connect in some way, more ideological, more utopian, whatever you want. The question is, okay, but what do you count in the present to make that, what's determining in the present? So 
what are the roads made of? What are the lamps and what is the kind of geography of the city that you need to walk around in order to get to the future or to conclude that the future is so far away that you can only see it very dimly? So that's not so much a matter of uh, the, the meaning of the expectations you put in the future, but the grammar of how we do so. Uh, so I very vaguely suggested here that we call a world the combination of these two questions. Okay? What are the elements that we need to, we can use to signify something, and the relations we're going to put between these elements and to give each other meanings, to extrapolate for the future, and so on. The reason why I want to do this is because uh, very two big, two important tendencies in, in the study of, of geo geopolitics and, and uh, uh, world history came from precisely trying to think, it's a very profound idea, trying to think no, no longer only socio-economic systems, but trying to think a system as a sort of boundary within which a certain regime of how you experience time, how you project the future, what you base the future on, is determined. So, for example, a certain society can have one way of portraying the future, it's different from another, because that's actually de materially determined by very precise economic, social conditions. Not all societies, evidently, are based on the same mode of production, the same way of exchange, the same value that the culture has in determining how people behave. All of these changes. So. These guys wanted to find ways of creating a, a certain sense of unity in all these conditions and questioning almost the experience inside this kind of sphere. You know, you have that Christmas globe thing with the snow inside, you know? So that's kind of a closure of a world inside of which you have a certain form of experience which can change or you can have different ones. You don't need to have some sort of idea that there's a big unity of all of this. So we want to know what is the space in which we're analyzing this. And what I wanted to do now very, hopefully, very quickly, but again, you guys can interrupt me as I do it, uh, is to give us a very brief uh, sense of how we can track a concept throughout time and show how it related to a world. And how it gave us, gave, gave us a bit of an idea of how we can understand the limits of that world, how people would signify things, and how it's not really just a matter of meaning, but also a matter of the grammar of how these things work. So, a very a uh, simple point, a very, very important concept, but also very central uh, to understand this, for example, is the idea of political body. In the Western societies, the idea of thinking society in terms of bodies, members, bodies and parts, bodies in the head of the body, in societies is uh, like, a, the human is like a part in a society which is itself like a human in some sense. Uh, it's an idea you'll find throughout history, you find it in Hobbes, the first page of the Leviathan, what I wanted to show is that the way that this is thought through changes very clearly from time to time and it becomes strangely materialized in the present, so that's why it's important for us. So a good place to start a story of the political body, considering this both, both these dimensions, syntactical and semantical aspects of it, is to begin with this very funny, not funny, but the very classic uh, fable by Agrippa, Menencius de Agrippa, uh, a, a patrician, patrician, sorry about my English, the patrician, right, the Roman patrician, who was tasked with uh, kind of conciliating a, a plebeian revolt in ancient Rome, and he went there and he gave this famous, he created this famous fable, but now we know it's not really this fable, but anyway, it's a famous guy, uh, which says, you know, there was there was this body and. Uh, the hands and the head and the mouth and the feet, they were all very uns discontent and unsatisfied with the stomach because they were working to get the food, chew the food, digest the food, and the stomach would get all the, the food and they were feeling like there was, weren't really, there wasn't much justice around. <laughs> so they stopped working. They stopped bringing food to the stomach and then you know what happened? They all died. So, you see the moral of the story. There's some sort of hidden harmony of the social body. You guys are fighting for your share, but you don't realize that actually you're losing something so you gain through the stomach, let's say, <laughs> through, the, through the circulatory system. So if there's a mistake in our understanding of what's going on. In fact, there is a unity here. You 
feel okay, perhaps you're malnutrition, you know, but like the stomach is also suffering. You know, everyone is suffering. The whole body is sick. It's not anyone's fault. So that's one of the first uh, examples we have of the use of the body to explain society through a figure of human anatomy. Uh, and this fable is cited and cited again and again and again by practically all important philosophers, including today Agamben, Marx courses. Uh, it's very important. Well, you'll find it again, for example, in Plato. In the Republic, you'll see Plato talking about the middle of, I don't remember which book, he talks about how the city is like a body, citizens are like the members of that body. And he says, only when you have the idea of justice, the idea of the good, and it's a very profound idea, he says, only when you understand the idea of the good and you see the city from the standpoint of that idea, which is like the head of this body, do you realize that, for example, when a citizen is hurt, it's like a hand is hurt. So you never say, I am hurt. Because a hand is, when the hand is hurt, the body is hurt. So it's funny that he had an idea that from the standpoint of justice, when one person gets hurt in the political body, the relation of pain or suffering is the relation of one body. So the, he, he says it's wrong to say, if you suffer, it's wrong to say, I am suffering, and it's wrong for the other person to say, you are suffering. If they say this, they're not thinking from the standpoint of the idea of justice. Which is like one hand looking at the other and saying, look, that hand is hurt. That hand is bleeding. That hand is going to die. Of course not. If that hand is going to die, you're going to die as well. So you see the slight shift in the, in the way you signify things, even though you're using the same metaphor. It's not really statist sort of defense of taxation. You know, like, you should lose something and not do so well off, but everything goes to the stomach for good reasons. In this case, it's not the stomach that's in the center, but the idea of the good, which is like the head, like some sort of unity. And if you're going poorly, if you're malnutrition or if you're overworked, you're actually, the w proper way of saying this is saying that the whole body is suffering. But it's the same act. Then you find it again in Aristotle. He will say, well, he was a more of a functionalist thinker, he would say, well, a body is something that maintains itself. A member is something that maintains the body, or an organ is something that maintains the body. If you take out an organ, okay, the body might suffer, but it might even survive. But if you take the body out, the organ doesn't even have a function. Because its function is determined by the whole. And then he said, but look at uh, humans. You only live through the city, because you need things that you cannot produce by yourself. And the city lives through itself. So who is the body and who is the member? You're actually more like an organ, and the city is more like a body. Because the finality of, your finality goes through, your essence goes through the city, while the essence of the city is for itself. The city exists for the city. You exist through the city. If I remove you from the city, you die. But the city is, goes on pretty well <laughs> without you anyway. <laughs> So, uh, again, there's a slight shift, but again, the idea that there is a body and we are members of a body, if you don't have the proper vision, intellectual vision of this unity, that's why you're disoriented. Because in reality, there's a harmony going on. So, this sequence is always the sort of bodies with organs or bodies with members, and the unity of this body is given by reason. So the idea of justice, the idea of good, or the idea of political power, but it's always outside of the world in some sense. Now, if you open, I don't know, I think it's the Cle I don't know how to translate this thing, so Ecclesiastes. Yeah. If you open the Bible, in the New Testament, and some one of St. Paul's Testaments there, letters, you find this very strange image, if you think about it from the terms that we're talking about. He will say, the Christian community, the group of all of us, we form a body which is the body of Christ. But that's a small problem because Christ is also a, a person. So the, the whole body, and he says Christ is the head of the body. Well, but if we're members of Christ, and Christ is a person, then the, that thing which is the totality of it is actually the same size as a member. So that thing which usually was thought of as being outside of the world, Right, the idea of justice, the idea of harmony, the idea of reason, from which you look at the world and you see that we are all connected. That standpoint from which you see everything is connected is now in the world. No wonder that it's in between, right? It's God, but it's man. It's 
we're, when we're connected, the community of believers is a body, but what, from which position do you need to stand to see that it is a body and there is some harmony or some connection? Not outside of the world, but from the standpoint of the specific life of one guy who suffered in a certain way, who was poor, and this and that. So if you take the position of the example of one life, you are in the standpoint from which you see the connection. It's no longer a connection given from above. It's given laterally. Of course, there will be a big debate, and people who usually do the taxation, they say, of course not. The connection is still given in the same way. But no wonder that traditions between more, let's say, emancipatory visions of Christianity and more state-like visions of religion, always fighting over the text. Because the text is kind of mediating, kind of like putting a virus in the program in that sense. Now, it's not so easy to argue that you need to go through a transcendental vision that only some people have access to justify your body's harmonious or not, social body. You can actually look at the, the example of somebody's concrete life, because if Christ is the body, and he's one of the guys, the relation changes. This is very important because this debate, for example, if you read the work of a guy called Ernst Kantorowicz, he has this very famous book called The, the, the King's Two Body. He, he shows how from then on, uh, not from then on, but already establishing itself in continuity with this, you see a tendency to look at the king as a representative of a social body and recognize that that guy is split into two bodies. For example, when the guy would die, I don't remember which sort of Roman uh, society would have this with this, this ritual, you would have to bury the physical body of the guy, you'd have to have a copy made of, oh my god, not called crayon. What do you call it? A candle is made wax. of wax. Yes, crayon. Made of crayon. <laughs> <laughs> made of wax. Uh, and then you had to burn that copy. The guy had to die twice. Because a king can die, but the image of the king still unifies the group. So you need to let go of that thing afterwards. And somebody else can then stand that position. So you have all these debates on sovereignty. Agamben, George Agamben does this debate to show us that, well, somehow the king occupies two places at once. He must be inside the law, he must be inside the community, and he must found the community, he must represent the whole. But that's hard for a person to do, in a certain sense. So the idea is, is, is hard, and, and I'll make a comparison. I should have brought this, it would be amazing, but we can do it in our heads afterwards. But, uh, for example, when you look at a painting of a king, the idea is that you're looking at something which concerns the history of that period, in the very image of the king. So the image of the king, the way that he's painted with all glory and so on, that glory is not his glory, it's the glory of his kingdom. So his person is supposed to absorb that excess, that position, more general position, which allows us to see the whole body, of social body in a certain sense. But at the same time, it's just a guy. That's why also the king is naked image is a bit the obverse of this. One hand, the guy is supposed to serve as a support for us to not look at myself. I don't see myself with the king. But it's like a mirror that when I look at him, I see that we are all being seen together. But on the other hand, the mirror is actually just a guy. So you have that duality. Compare that, for example, with a pretty photo of Angela Merkel today. When you look at Angela Merkel, you don't see the German people. You see the German people when you look at the chair that she's sitting on. You see a photo of the German cabinet, I don't know how you call with an empty folk, empty seat. You see, that's the German people. They support that empty place there, they vote, and they guarantee the, the legitimacy of whoever sits there. But you see a photo of her, it's not like seeing the photo of a king, right? So something changed in the way that the person is no longer the mirror, it's not a positive mirror of the social body. It's actually a negative one. When you see the empty seat, you're seeing more of everyone together than when you see somebody sitting on it. So what happened? So, this guy here called, uh, not this guy here, this <laughs> other guy called T.J. Clark wrote one of the best art history essays I've ever read, called, I forgot how, it's, called, it's one of a book called uh, Farewell to an Idea, I think the essay is called uh, Year One, uh, it talks about the French Revolution through this painting. Uh, and he says, well, this Jacques-Louis da, da, David painting of Marat, was an important revolutionary in the French Revolution, it captures something very special. He says, uh, well, and he analyzes very specifically how David, who was part of the revolution, had an important role to play as well, was 
head of a committee and so on, he was given a task that is very complicated because the French Revolution was all about taking down the guy who you need to look at to see the whole. And now the revolutionary who was leading the movement of taking down representatives needs now to be represented. So how are you going to represent the guy who stands for the end of political representation in this absolute sense? If you paint him like, you know, a hero, you're putting him back with the kings. The guy who you look to, to see everyone, right? But you cannot not paint the guy, because he was such an important guy, he was just murdered and so on. So what, how do you paint this painting? And so he analyzes very carefully everything that was going on. The painting was, was done in the turmoil of after the death, and people wanted the a painting to take to the streets and hold up. So it was like not, not so much as a, a historical guy looking to the past, he was more like a Mali, uh, Mayakovsky or those guys like uh, Rodchenko in the, the Russian Revolution doing posters as they go to represent what's going on right now. It's very fresh in that sense. And look at what he chose to do. He chose to leave the upper half black. Like you can divide this thing here almost in half. Come on. This is more than half. Right? Perhaps here the half is, right? So look how much of it is absolutely not. And you don't get here the guy in all the glory. You get here the naked king, right? from that duality we're talking about. If you were, if you were to put this on one of the sides, you would put this closer to, has more of overtones of the crucified guy in the cross, right, the human side of, of this totality, than the glorified side of it, right? And he says something that's very important, he says, well, if you look well at this and uh, take notice that he didn't just leave this black, he painted a lot of stuff here, see how, how of detail to it. He says, well, this is the first time that an abstract painting was produced. Because this thing here, what is it trying to say? It's trying to say that nothing can represent. It's not simply absent. It's painting the fact that nothing could be painted here. So there is a lot of intensity in this part. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply like, for example, if you leave a part of the, the painting black. It's more like you're trying to paint the work, you're trying to write there, this is not a revol this is not a king. This is not a representative of the people. This is just a guy. Because it's only by having that stated that we can actually look at this painting and support it as French revolutionaries. If we took this guy to mean this is the man, this is the guy we've been all waiting for, people will say, man, but that's the contrary of what we were doing, what he was doing. So how do you solve this? So the only way is this is the statement, saying this is actually just just a guy. Right? So for to do this, you have to have this thing on top here, actually represent that there's nothing to represent, which is different to say that it's not representing anything. The same way that when you look at the empty chair of Angela Merkel, it's not that you're not looking at anything. You're looking at the absence of something, and you're looking at the fact that you could put something there, right? And that nobody will ever fulfill that, uh, fill that seat completely. So that seat is not like any empty seat. The empty seat of, of uh, important state representative, it, it's more like this screen here, saying, look, this is charge. There's, this absence is not like any absence. It's not simply not, right? So what this other guy, very important guy, Eric Sandner, proposes is that, well, but then this positivity that was here, this glorious, excessive figure that was here, and that can no longer be there, where did it go? Did it simply end? Can you end something like this? Does it, don't you need the king who looks like abusively excessive and has some access to his own private life, and it's more than just himself. And he says, well, this migrated to everyone. So when you vote, you're expected to be more than yourself. You're expected to think of other people. You're expected to have concerns more than your own concerns. So he says, what were the two bodies of the king? Become the two bodies of everyone. Everyone is now divided, in some sense, between these two dimensions. You have something which concerns only your survival, only your life, you as a member of the community, but somehow you're parasitized by the fact that the whole of the community concerns you as well. So for him, this actually was displaced rather than erased. Uh, the, this is very important because uh, without this, it's hard to understand what's going on with modern politics, I think. Because modern politics is about giving a name and a destiny to that thing in individuals, which is more than the individual. You want to name what it is that is more than you, you. For example, Kant will call it reason. He says, you, you can reason, you don't need any transcendental 
religion or, or text to tell you what to do. But if you, there's a way of thinking that allows you to think about what's more than your own pathological interest. You can think about what's the good, universal good. You can turn your subjective maxim, as it calls, into your universal uh, categorical imperative. How to behave. And if you behave in accordance to that, you're behaving not in accordance with your own interests, but you're behaving in accordance with everyone's interests. So he, said, he named this excess reason. Rousseau would name this excess political will. He says, well, there is no only particular political will. There is a general will. Meaning that the direction of a society should be based on that in everyone, which is our political capacity to think about the common good, in a certain sense, and not about our own private good. And the whole point is, okay, but how do you capture this, this capacity? Is it true? participate in the determination of our own society, how do you turn that into something that has efficacy? So that was an important problem for Rousseau. And it's funny that in the English tradition, the way that we name this excess was through labor. When you're working, like the famous passage from The Wealth of Nations in Smith, but when you're only interested in your own stuff, when you're only concerned with going to the market, buying your own, stuff that you need to survive and to live the life that you want, that's how we are coordinating among each other for society to form some sort of harmonious uh, uh, whole. So we shouldn't look at political will because honestly you can will this or that, but you're still buying this or that, and this is actually the determining principle. Uh, there's actually a very realistic principle in that. If I'm employed, you're my employer. Uh, I have a vote, you have a vote. Well, you pay me. I actually survive because you pay me. So if I vote against your interest, you might lose the, the factory where I work. So it's better that I vote with your interest because this way I still get paid. So economic order can very well determine how we vote. So the political will can be distorted by economy. So that's a way of saying, well, this is more fundamental principle. Or saying, well, economic, economic order has its own reason. It doesn't have, follow the Kantian reason. So it has this idea of it's excessive to the individual, just like we were talking about, but it's somehow more grounded in life itself, right? It, it does seem like, and this is Sentner's thesis, George Ogamben's thesis, uh, Slavoj Žižek's thesis, that somehow this sublime dimension of the king is now parasitizing economic order. The way we treat money, for example, is very much with the reverence that we was supposed to have to kings. Perhaps the, the king is naked and money is just a paper bill. Is the sort of those are perhaps the equivalent statements, and the mystery appears in the same way. How is the king more than just a guy? And how the hell is money more than just paper? How can it be determined by something that only exists because you're giving it that power? So metaphysical question, and it kind of displaced in the same way. But now uh, it's hard to argue that political economy. Are you against the fact that political economy, the, looking at the world from the standpoint of economic space and how that space organizes our lives, that this became the central way of thinking about the present, how it's organized, and therefore how it should be determined for things to happen in the future. Right? The idea of progress, which all of these thinkers wanted to think, Rousseau had a concept of coming out of a state of nature and going towards self-determination, meaning owning our own future in some way, and telling what's going to happen in the future for all of us and saying that political will is the tool for us to get there. Uh, Kant would say, he has a very beautiful text about questioning if we can look at the future and, and expect humanity to progress or to stay the same or to go, uh, well, down the drain. And it's beautiful the way that he, he says, we, we cannot know, experience cannot tell us if we're progressing or not. But we hear and Konigsberg looked at the French Revolution with enthusiasm, even though it didn't concern us at all. Like, nothing's changing for us, he thought, uh, because of it. So he said, if I'm inter enthusiastic about it, there is something like a disinterested interest in communities. I can still feel like something concerns me when people do something for justice. And he says, well, therefore, there must be some sort of transcendental motivation towards justice and rights fairness and so on. So he says, well, we can extrapolate from this that the future tends towards a more just society. Uh, 
So all of them will connect, understanding what's the determining principle in the present with the future. I mean, I don't need to talk much about the idea of relation between progress, development, and economy, how those things, growth, they're all clo very closely knit concepts. So we can definitely say that somehow the idea of political economy, the fact that it begins by accepting that people cause things that are bigger than them through labor, exchange, consumption, that organizes the idea that sovereignty go, happens through economy, that organizes the idea that this is the determining principle through which we can determine our future, we can answer for the future, prepare the future, right? And it's also why the idea of revolution, the idea of political transformation happened with people who took political economy very seriously. Uh, it was not who saw followers of, so followers of Kant, but people who studied political economy who said, okay, this thing is not so clear cut about what, what you can extrapolate from it. This is actually based on a very profound contradiction, the way the economic order is built in this society. So we can extrapolate from it in multiple ways. And there are multiple struggling sovereign, sovereign powers here, which Marx would call social classes. So what I wanted to do for the rest of this brief moment that I have before we end is to talk a bit about how Marx then distinguished himself from this, because he didn't put the emphasis on labor. He said, well, if labor was just the cause of all commodities, and just the cause of how economic order is organized, that would be fine, but labor is a commodity itself. Meaning, labor is also determined by something. It's not just determining, it's also determined. If labor is determined, why is it that it's being sold and bought when you buy and sell labor? He says, well, it's people's time. So you're buying and selling your time. When you are unemployed and looking for a job, you're pretty much going around saying you can use my time for eight hours a day, ten hours a day. And if you work, depending on the field you work the whole time. Uh, for a purpose that I don't know what it is, I don't really care what it is, I can rationalize that it's going to benefit me and going to grow, but the lower you are in social situation, the more this is irrelevant. Whatever job you can get, you're going to get it. You don't, don't care really what you're going to do in that time. All you want to do is get the, the payment for giving the person that time. So it's actually a matter of time, not so much a matter of labor. Labor is a, the labor commodity is a way of naming how you sell your time. Not a way of, of naming how you employ your human activity or something. So Marx would say that in the end of the day, what's actually excessive, what actually organizes com uh, communities, what actually is excessive to the individual, is our relation to how we give and take time from people. So why am I, I don't, I'm not going to go into detail about Marx here, but what, what, why is this important? Because it is precisely this conception that, well, at the end of the day, it's actually temporality now that is the cause, the basis of all of this, of our political society and so on, and how we organize this, that organizes a certain treatment of this horizon of expectation. So I, all of this I did until now is just to show you that uh, we can treat a certain dimension connected with polit politics, connected with economy, connected with what, uh, how is time treated uh, as, let's say, the material which is then the determining principle out of which we can extrapolate ideologically about the future or in a sort of utopian modern thinking about what to come in the future. And I prepared, just to conclude, a, a kind of a graph for us to look at about how different the future was expected at different moments in time and how close we thought that was to the present. So you see this axis here says, okay, when would it happen in relation to the present? This axis here says, okay, but this thing that's going to happen very far away or very close, how different is it from what we already have, you know? So, as I said here, you can see that this kind of more millennial idea that, well, you want to see something very different, you need to wait for an infinitely distant time, because it's not time, it's eternity, and it's going to be so ridiculously different that you can't even talk about it, really, you know? It's just out of this world, literally. <laughs> The only time that that expression was not funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, as we were talking about, something happens here that this thing, which was still 
pass out of the world, somehow it falls into the world. The French Revolution, is, together with the American Revolution, that can be said to be the moment that this is kind of immanentized. It falls into the world. Suddenly we have, perhaps not a date, but we need to find in our own vision of the future, in history, a moment that we say, well, this in the future something can happen. And you can, you can, you could extrapolate. Is this 500 years in the future? Is it 200 years? Is it 100 years? So the moment the French Revolution happened, a lot of places start to question. Okay, but is it that far away? It just happened here. Perhaps it's going to happen very near. And it's interesting to see in the conservative literature of the time, both in the revolutionary and conservative, how they treated this almost like the only metaphor they had was that something like a natural event, like a, new, a revolution erupted. Like as if it rained on people, you know, change rained on people. Because there wasn't really many ways of explaining something that can really affect a seismic shift in our world that doesn't come from the outer world. The only other place it can come is from nature. So they had to kind of work through the idea that so society can break itself into two in that way. So you get around this time the idea that, well, the future can look very different. What, what can be proposed by a revolution? actually be a totally different order uh, but the the time of for regular people of when that will happen how it will happen etc was still very vague and very far I mean you, you distinguish between what was the reaction to re revolutionary France for example from the reaction to October Revolution or the years prior to it it's not a matter of hundred years it's a matter of very imminent we're gonna do something we're organizing the 1800s to take power to hundred years from you know, the June journeys in France to actually something substantial, 60, 70 years, something substantial in Russia to happen. But it's much shorter period of time than eternity. Let's agree on that at least, right? So you get a, this is totally qualitative change, but you already get a kind of sequence here where utopian thinking feels authorized to imagine a different world within our world. So within our world of expectations, the horizon of expectations, the future looks kind of vaguely ahead. It's hard to pinpoint where it should be, but it holds a lot of promise. It's very different, but it, it becomes more and more, let's say, uh, manageable in a certain sense. And we could say that this, this sequence here, the goes between revolution and wars, the world wars, is a sequence where revolutions seem every, ev ever the more close to us. We could prepare for it. We could conspire for it to happen. We could think, well, an, another, people would write manuals, like the ABC of communism. If you ever open a book like this, if you ever read the vanguard literature or art in, in Russia, in this period here, it's amazing what they thought they would be able to accomplish just after taking power. They, the guys were just peasants organizing to take a Tsar, but they were writing books of cosmonauts going to Mercury. <laughs> what the hell? They, 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 look at how creatively absurd, how different they imagined their life would be after some sort of transformation happened, which was pretty close for them. They thought it was like just there, right? There is an important contradiction here, which is the reason why it was so close was because wars were going on. And the wars had a, a preliminary role of shaking up social structures. So, you're already involved in a big disordering of the world. The proletariat in a country is mixed with another because they're both in battle, in the battlefield. Everyone's now mixed from different regions because they're all with uniforms going into war. You already have some sort of material basis to expect that this is shorter and shorter in terms of it's closer to you in the future. It's exciting because the world is in such frenzy that you feel like, okay, this is about to happen. And it's funny if you look at uh, revolutionary politics and, and the way that they imagine, uh, for example, between the French Revolution, it took, oh, uh, the, the first international is 870 something. So 870, they founded the first international work, work, workman uh, association to plan something that would change the world in an even more absurd way than the French Revolution did. It would change everything. Then, they thought it would just associate people together, start conspirations, this would slowly, with the help of what was going on economically, this would lead to something. 
by the October Revolution and just after it, you had the Second International, which lead, led to the October Revolution. You have the Third International, which is just after it. And they say, now we have a country where we're, we're, we're running, we're calling the shots. And the war helped to organize, to destabilize the situation. So we need to prepare for a next war. In this next war, the world will be disordered again. But we, now we have a much bigger infrastructure, and that will be a very important moment. So Lenin was very concerned with the idea that we need to be ready for a war that is coming. But look how interesting it is. We're not looking for the revolution. We're looking for the war. When the war happens, the revolution will happen. But then here we have a relation of consequence between war and revolution. But what's to be expected is a war. So the Third, third International was founded on the principle that we should conspire, organize, prepare, so that when a, a war comes, we're ready to move and do things. Uh, funny enough, the Third International was dissolved in 1942. So apparently that didn't work out. And it, it's very interesting to understand why it was dissolved. Uh, but war is a fundamentally different idea of expectation for the future than a revolution. So a revolution is all about the idea that some order, other order comes about after Something. You have some system, something interrupts it, and then you get a different order. But a war is not about a different order. A war is about protecting your order against someone else's order. When a war sets in, your life really changes. It's true. If you have the expectation of going to war at any time, you're not going to look at your commitments for the future in the same way. You can become a soldier at any moment, for example. This is sort of total mobilization wars, like for example, the way the English population had to be turned into an army from day to night, from night to day. So, uh, war says that if you expect war, you expect your life world to be suspended in some sense. Something in your life can no longer be the same, but nothing comes to substitute it. Right? In the ultimate sense of this, you get with nuclear war. The idea is that well, it will suspend your your life world and your the way your social place. Will definitely change, but won't change into anything. It will just change, period. It will change into nothing, right? So you still get the idea of change, but the idea of change in war is the idea that you have an order and you have an interruption. The best case is you get the, best, the same order back, but war itself doesn't promise anything different. So you see that idea that how different it is, it's now a bit closer to the present. The best you can do is kind of protect yourself, You're the best that you already have, but you don't really want to lose, but there's nothing much to gain in terms of, you can expand. It's actually a very interesting thing to consider the difference between these two things. Because liberal politics in general is a very spatial idea. It's all about expansion. We already got there, now we need to expand, because the more expensive a liberal project is, the more safe, the better the rate, the quality of life generally will be with the spatial fights. So it's actually very much more a question of war. We need to go everywhere, bring peace everywhere, because spatial domination means more stability. Whereas revolutionary war was always about uh, you negotiate space in order to gain time, something in the future, something that doesn't happen yet. It's a different logic. It's a much more temporal endeavor than a spatial endeavor. You don't know what you want. You don't even have it yet. Nobody has it yet. But things need to change so that you get to a situation where you can have it. Whereas this sort of more, more liberal view of politics, you already have something that you want. You need either to protect it from decreasing in space where that thing is valued, or increasing in allowing other people to have the same value. But there, you see, the revolution already depended a bit on war. But this kind of leads to a weird change where now you, revolution happened during the war. So let's wait for the next war. But now the next war is a promise of less. The war doesn't promise that much. But this uh, is uh, still not as bad <laughs> as what happened. Because between the, the, the October Revolution, this idea that now we need to wait for wars, uh, and let's say the end of the Cold War. The Cold War is a good example of what it means to organize the world around war. You already know the orders that are in dispute. There's nothing new to be added. The novelty is that, well, if one side wins over the other, one thing that you already know that's very well known from experience, not an expectation in terms of 
something not experienced by anyone. This thing everyone already knows can take over another thing that everyone already knows. But you won't get anything unexperienced yet. Um, something that's out of our space of experience. You don't get something that you don't even know what it is. Well, you can say, of course, you don't know what it is to have a global evil communist revolution, of course. But you imagine it, the imagination of a war that leads to a hegemony of one side in this Cold War, a totally different exercise of imagination than the cosmonauts going to Mars. The Cold War will not be the, it lead us to the moon as a, in a different way that it would lead us to Mars for a crazy Platonov guy in Russia, in a crazy guy in you know, 1910. It's very different, something changed in the imagination. And we're, with this we're tracking a bit very big markers that do give us some, some of the uh, means to understand how these things would mean different futures, right? So between war and what I think the best name of is crisis, so economic crisis, uh, you get a period where war appears, is slowly, uh, well, wars happen as well due to economic crisis, you know this very well, cycles of, of business, the business cycles of capitalism, the need to re, uh, I don't know how to say this, reignite an economy, and many economies in, in a situation where you have no very big crisis of overproduction in many places in the capitalist world. Uh, so you can see, there was war behind the revolution, and in fact there was also crisis, because we had the first crisis of uh, primitive accumulation, colonization was very much a problem, and, and this, an institution that was establishing itself in the modern world, War was going on everywhere, but it seemed like revolution was the efficacious, efficacious idea, even though these three things were happening at the same time. It was revolution that allowed us to foresee an open future. At this time here, we had revolution as well. And we had October Revolution, we had a bunch of revolutions throughout the world after this, but it was war that was the efficacious idea about the future. And you had economic crisis as well, kind of spreading, distributing in the space of, of our geopolitical environment, where these wars would be set, where revolutions were possible, but it was the idea of war that was actually orienting our political imagination. And you see that this, even this idea gets more and more unsettled as our, well, Armageddon capacity grows. It doesn't really hold the possibility of saying, you have your world, if a war happens, things will not be the same but nothing new would happen, but it's just not the same. So you can imagine your social place being moved around. If your social place is moved around by a big war, that's the last time your social place will be messed with, because after that, there's nothing. So war can no longer be the same thing. So the idea is that, and, and you find that we find those rights that we were discussing in the beginning, exactly here, 1970 something, when the idea of how you manage a crisis, a certain economic golden age that happens between 40s and the 70s starts losing its, its stability. But now we don't have any more revolutionary future. Uh, like fu the future is not uh, guaranteed as a place, syntactically guaranteed in our discourse by the idea of revolution. And it's not semantically, therefore, imagined, like the, the meaning we ascribe to it is not a very different thing. Nor is it more, nor is it more like guerrilla fights for revolutionaries, or let's win a war against something, against an enemy. No longer also meaningful in that sense. So war loses this capacity to mean change. So we're going to extend the free world. Well, but you're not fighting anymore against a very big enemy that has another political vision of the world. You don't know what you're fighting against. Where is the problem? So it's, war is not, not sufficient just to organize this idea that there's something to hope for in the future. The only thing you have to hope for is that, well, there either is an equilibrium in the system or there is not. So either the system is in a critical position or it's not in a critical position, right? So what, what I find very important in this, and I'm getting right here, but it's important to understand, and I'll finish with this, is that it's only in light of this that you can see a very important counter tendency, which is Rather than expect difference from the future, we begin to experience, expect difference from the past. So if you want to learn about something that nobody experienced before, look at the history of populations which were decimated, 
look at the people who were oppressed, look at the memory, the archives. So around the same time here that not even war can be understood as a meaningful concept to think something new about the future, we turn to the past. So genealogy, critical studies about memory, critical studies about invisibilized cultures and histories, all of this becomes charged, which is, has an importance on its own, no, no doubt, but it becomes charged with the pressure of providing with us with something new to orient the world, because the novelty now needs to come from the past, it cannot come from the future. So there's a weird change. The funny thing is, suddenly the world sounds very psychoanalytic, because that seems like from, as we said, very commonsensical term, that's what analysis at least seems to be doing. You go to analysis, you say, my, I don't have any prospect for the future for whatever reason. I think I'm sick. I have the symptom. This is happening. My relationship is no good. My, my job is not really the best. And you want to find in the past something that redeems it. Not, an, not only an explanation, but a, uh, uh, something that is efficacious in changing your life. So suddenly it seems like the past is that which holds the key for something new, which is very different, it's a very new idea, right? So it's funny because this is about where we find those authors talking that, well, around the 70s, suddenly it seemed like there was no future anymore. We didn't know how to effic efficacy, uh, efficaciously refer to a point that in, in the name of this point in the future, which means some difference, which means some promise, you're, you're willing to renounce something in the present, as we were talking about at the beginning. So for example, in the revolution years, you, had a, a, you didn't have the image of the soldier. The revolution wasn't made by soldiers. It was made by some sort of free man. Even the American Revolution or the French Revolution was all about some idea of a militant with some sort of uh, very idealist vision of what he's going to make, or somebody who's adventuring to uncharted territory. So you renounce your peace and quiet for some sort of strange adventure concerning state affairs and something like this. From here to here, we see a total change in the idea of what a militant is. And the militant becomes a figure of a soldier. He's a heroic guy who abandons his life, gets a bayonet, goes to a field where events are happening that are totally mismeasured to his own human scale. Get bombs everywhere. He's going to go into places he's never seen and have strange stories to tell. Uh, but that's the sort of logic that explains why you are willing to renounce something to gain something else. It's very interesting that, again, Benjamin was the guy perhaps that realized that, well, guys, this is not going our way, this idea of revolutions, because he starts seeing soldiers coming back from the First World War, and they had nothing to tell. No experience was gained. There's a rich short text called Experience and Poverty. It's an amazing text. I think it's from 1931. Uh, where he says, well, people went to war and they came back, they had nothing to say. How can you have nothing to say? This is the, the concept that singles out the moment in your life that you should be living something that is different from your regular life. So how the hell that's not an experience? How the hell is it totally, either totally equal to your everyday life or so different that there's nothing to say? So he, at that moment, he says, well, perhaps something's not going our way. Perhaps we should pull the brakes in the locomotive of history, that idea of progress, of being in the future, closer and closer to the present in a certain sense, or leading the, pleasure, the present closer to the future, is actually the opposite. We're trying to get the present to become a future. It's actually the future that is coming so close to the present that there's nothing to say about the future. Nothing to say about the situation where you lose your social place, go meet new people in new countries, and something like this. So, this that's why it's, something is diminishing. You see, this is a line that's just cl coming closer and closer to the present. It's closer and closer, hard to find a place, a name for something in the future that you expect that would change everything, that is not a natural catastrophe. And that still, you can say, when this happens, everything will be different, or something important will be different. And, and something that is, is good enough for you to say, I'm willing to lose everything or lose something in order to gain in the future. So, for example, you'll have very different things. Like, the, it's, in fact, it's a very interesting thing. Have you seen the movie The Shelter? When the guy starts building a bunker or a shelter in his house, he starts changing his life because he thinks a very big natural catastrophe is going to happen. It's called Take Shelter, right? 
Okay, it's a small inconvenience. But uh, there are many moves like this, and well, the sur survivalist movement is a good example. People change their lives. Sometimes they become very much alienated from their communities because at least the idea that some catastrophe that we're not going to survive in a natural sense is about to happen, that's something that that's something that I'm going to stake that's worth changing my life for. So that's still, let's say, the last name of the future for these people is, well, the future holds a natural catastrophe that if I don't start talking things, learning how to shoot, how to train for extreme scenarios, I won't be able to survive it. That's still a bit of a bargain about renouncing a pleasurable or individual life for the sake of something different in the future, right? It's funny. And, and it's, the important thing is that it's coming ever so near to the present. So for example, if the revolutionary years, you would get a certain sort of pathology, for example, uh, this, the, the way that people suffer, what they suffer from, it's very different. It's still very much connected with religion, very much connected with superstition and things like this. Pathologies change with time. For example, Freud started thinking about uh, uh, the death drive, the idea that symptoms and tend to repeat things that can never end. Exactly when he started receiving wounded soldiers from the war, the first war. He said, well, neurosis is something strange. It's funny because it's, it's interesting that the period between the beginning of the century until the first war is a, from 1880 to 910 is the period of Freud's study hysteria at the moment. And it's a very sort of revolutionary thing that he writes about. People who don't want to have the place in society that they have. They want another thing. They don't know what it is. But it's like they're parasitized by something excessive that rules over them, that they cannot rule over it. It's very much like what we're talking about the king. It's like you're your own king, but he doesn't agree with you very much. Right? So I want to go this way, but my leg is paralyzed. You do all medical exams you can, and there's no reason that your leg is paralyzed. Why the hell can't you not use your, your, your leg? Or you want to say if a, uh, you're perfectly capable of speaking. There's one sentence you cannot speak. You're in perfect control of yourself. So why can't you do that? So why are you impotent? Who is, who is telling you that you cannot do it? There's no one telling you you cannot do it. That's what Freud would call the superego. It's like a little king in your head. So you're a bit of your own sovereign, and you're your own subject. But those two figures don't necessarily agree. The rules that are set for you by yourself don't necessarily are the rules you want to follow. So there is a certain kind of revolutionary paradigm of, of treating pathologists like kind of strange visitors, sovereign visitors that are in you, telling you to do things, but you don't want to do them. You want to have an affair with your neighbor, but it's against the, the law of where you live. But you cannot follow the law to where you live. You feel compelled to do that thing, and to betray yourself in front of everyone and let other people know that that's what you want to do. It's like there is a more important sovereign than the local sovereign. So there was this kind of subversive aspect to the pathologist that Freud would treat in this period. Then he starts talking about uh, people who came back from the war and he saw something crazy. The guy who came from the war, traumatized by what he saw, with no wounds, he couldn't get over it. The guy who came back from the war saw a big explosion, people died, but he was hurt with the explosion. He could get over it. He was normal life, no symptoms, he would never dream about it again, it's fine. The guy who saw the explosion, had no cuts, nothing happened to him. He would dream about it every night. He couldn't explain this repetition. Since a, somehow something is not registering in your experience, if you don't return to it all the time and time again, you cannot continue living. You cannot remember it in some way. So there's a very important shift in Freud studies that we all normally posit around the 20s. Concerns trying to explain why something changed and now people are suffering in a new way. And it's interesting, if we consider continuing time, we'll see, for example, the total absurd, uh, uh, what do you call it, not dispersion, but uh, expansion of the depression and melancholia and panic as the sort of big pathologies of the present. Pathologies of, I don't think anything worth happening in the future, I don't think anything new is going to happen to me, you know, I'm not as good as people who came before me, so you see that sort of depression is a sort of pathology that plays a, a lot with the idea that there is nothing to expect anymore, or the things that I can expect that are not worth expecting, mm -hmm. right? 
And the other side of that, which we're talking about catastrophes, is anxiety, panic attacks. It seems like all of a sudden, anything terrible could happen and you're not prepared, you cannot be prepared, your heart starts pumping like crazy and there's nothing to do. So you can see that there's a weird relation between the sort of projection of the future you can have in a given moment and the, how you suffer in all those moments. And it's funny because that Mannheim guy, who I mentioned about the ideology and utopia thing, he actually, one of the things he says that's very beautiful in his book, he says, it's funny that if you look at religious movements in the 1500s, where this idea of utopia, religious thing that you can expect for the future, but in our world, was starting to establish itself. Utopias were not meant to plan, to help you plan stuff. They were help you suffer stuff. So you would lead a terrible life, which is hard to articulate how terrible your life is. But through a utopia, so you construct something that's the horizon of what could be different from your life, and in comparison with it, you can articulate how much you're suffering. Man, things be so different, and they are this way. A, a just world be like this, so I feel so anger, angry that the, the world is unjust. So you don't need to create a comparison simply to get there. You need to create a comparison so you can actually experience what you're going through. So his idea was that utopias are actually ways of teaching you how to suffer about the present as well. Of course, they have other possible other uses, but they have this use. So it's interesting to see that the future has a part to play in the grammar of how people suffer through time. And it changes a lot. Right, so it's interesting to see that psychoanalysis had to wait until the future was an open thing and you could project into the future expectations. Without this, the very idea of desire doesn't really make much sense. What do you want from the things you want? That's the question of desire. You say you want to drink water, but what do you get by drinking water? Of course, there's a biological, physiological problem, but there's also something else that you get. When you get a job, many people want a job. Why does that person want that job? What will that person get by wanting that job? You might expect many things from it, like my family will be happy with me, a better, better chance of getting a stable relationship, but I was seen by my partner in a new way. Those are things that are what you desire and the objects that you desire have to do with expectation. So changes in the space of expectation will affect how you suffer from not getting what you desire, from desiring things you thought you shouldn't desire, things like this. So you see that there's a big shift here that's underlying it's connected with economical, cultural, political situations, underlying a certain the construction of a space within which you can suffer in different ways. So we're looking at sort of background of a lot of con. As I told you guys, it would be a lot of stuff and confusing. And so you just got what I told you you would get it. But at least it's enough to see that there is some concepts there that help us understand that we don't suffer the way we do now because that's natural. There is a very strong, complicated background of changes that lead us from suffering in one way and in one moment in time in one place to suffering differently in another place in another moment in time and so on. There's a history of stuff that is an institutional history. It's not a personal history. People suffer different in different moments in time. So how can psychoanalysis that was created for a period where there was a future, even though it was fresh and open and changing and then looming and closing and so on, but created within this period until, well, but right before the fall of the Berlin Wall. How is psychoanalysis a practice created to think about desire in this world? How does it relate to a world where this is no longer the same? It might be closing in in a catastrophic sense to us. It's not simply different. It's not just we expect different things. It's very hard. It's a great exercise, I think, to do like Plato's students did with him, sitting down, and trying to imagine a better city like the Republic they do. It's, it's, it's not very easy to do that. You, you feel like you're trying to exercise a muscle perhaps you don't even have anymore. It's a ghost <laughs> limb, perhaps. So uh, what does it mean to do psychoanalysis in this predicament? Right? That's what will be the theme of the next <laughs> of tomorrow. We'll come back tomorrow. Yes, and exactly. Uh, we, we began a bit late, so I imagine that we could go I on think for we, a bit. We, we have some time uh, if people want to have any questions, maybe 10 minutes or so. Yeah, but in any way, you guys, you can, if, if any of this interests you in any way, uh, I can give you my email and talk anytime. I don't feel like we need to absorb any of this craziness in like 10 minutes. But uh, this is on research that more than interest will get more, more kind of ideas on how do you think this could be pursued or the problems with this. So something I'm still 
the search you, you can contact me at any time if you think like you want to debate this as well but also as we go to lunch soon you can also go to your talk and do your lunch so it's not a problem as you guys have a what's that uh, well i mean I, I have a question that kind of popped up because there's uh i know you're familiar with this book uh jean-pierre dupuy right and he talks about that Right, the spontaneous position, right, is that the uh, the presupposition that the future is inherently open, right, is not in fact a condition for the, the, some kind of radical change between the present and the future, but in fact it, it almost paradoxically works in the other way around. Like the best way to assure that the future is going to be more of the present is to sort of spontaneously, uncritically assume that the future is open, underdetermined, right, Inde un un undetermined. But then he's got this thing about like you have to posit a catastrophe in the future. And only if you see that as inevitable does that sort of produce a certain urgency for act activity in the, in the present, right? Uh, and my question is this, because from the way that you put it um, in the previous sections, the idea up until Marx, predominantly, I think, uh, the idea was there was something in the present, right, which could articulate um, the outlines of the future, right? Uh, I think you said, like, the determining principle of the present is going to also be the thing which can and you know, sort of elucidate what a, a future would be. But in at each case, there was something like a, a possibility, right, inside of the present, which opened the doors to a radically different future, right? Uh, but now, if the suggestion is that the, uh, and then of course, given that, then you can start writing these crazy books about what the future is gonna look like, you can kind of imagine, blah, blah, blah. But today, the, I guess it's more just, if you can sort of comment on this, because I'm not really sure how to, frame this question, but um, now if you have the supposition where there's two tendencies, right? There's this idea that the future is just more of the present, right? Which will either sort of stay the same and expand liberal democracy for everybody, or it's going to become catastrophic for economic reasons, environmental, whatever you want. And the critical disposition for people tends to be uh, a reinterpretation of the past. So we look for, let's say, sexism or uh, racism or patriarchy or class or Genocide, whatever. I think well, no, but I mean, we look for that in uh, uh, sort of the structures of the past. We look for it in language. We look at genealogies. We look at roots of things, etc. And there's something interesting to me. While it seems like it's not necessarily productive, while then you could say in previous sections you had a reinterpretation, a reorganization of the present, which allowed the present to pivot to a new future, which was seen as open. Now you see the future from this perspective as closed, and then what you do is the, it seems to me like the possibility of a different future hinges on a reinterpretation of the past, as opposed to sort of just a repivoting of the future or of the present. Is that? Yeah, uh, I think it's. I would. Okay, but that, that, is that sort you, of in line with okay. what the suggestion is? Or yeah, I, uh, if that makes any sense after five well, minutes of labouring. A lot of. So <laughs> my point is this. Uh, I think that's why I can get my trousers dirty with chalk. Uh, so we have a space here. We call the space. Of experience, and we said that this. Do you want to just roll up the screen, maybe? Because I'm not sure. Can you guys see yeah. that? Is that okay? okay. Yeah. See. Oh, right. So, and we say so. Space of the experience is going to well, breathe very interesting, but anyway, speaks of experience. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you have the horizon of expectation. Now we finally know you really are a psychoanalyst. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, something in the future, we say this is a place. Something is going to happen, and, and so what's going to happen here is going to be very different, little bit. And this is, let's say, everything that all the facts that are written in the present in one way or another, be it with written documents, be it because you take the the subway in Rio de Janeiro and you can see that the black population is going one way, <laughs> far away from the city and just coming back when it's time to work. The subway is only with white people near the elite center, so that's a fact. It's writing a whole history in the present. So there's a whole history of slavery and oppression that leads to that fact in the present. So all the ways in the past is written here, right? And all the ways that we can talk about here, about how we still the future is coming on. So I think that there are three big things that we can do. You can posit something for the future and say, Nothing has happened here, but something will happen, right? You can say that something has happened, right? 
Or you can say something is happening. What I find very interesting, and it connects with what you're saying, is that well, there are many ways of reading, for example, Marx. Some people will say that Marx said that we're living in a capitalist world, but something will happen, a revolution. Other guys, so normally those are more politically driven Marx. They say, we live in a world of suffering, we need to make something happen, something will happen. There are Marxists who say, no, but what more Marx was suggesting that something has already happened. Capitalism, when it, capitalism, when it was set in motion, set in motion a contradiction. So this thing, the future, in a sense, then already happened. Because the past, which is the beginning of modern capitalist society, already will lead us somewhere. So the event already happened, which was probably Marx. Marx was the event. He allowed us to see that it's better thing to get out of the way, or just to help history move. So the event has already happened. We just need to leave things along. There's a third movement, which is people who say that something is happening, which is very hard to see what this means. But I'll go to this and the other question. So I do think that if you look at the graph that we pre presented, the little diagram there, it does seem like, well, the more you empty this out, the more you start to expect from the past. It's funny. It's not that you know in the past. You expect from the past. Based, so you do an archaeology of the present, and you expect that the past will teach you something new to change the present, not change the future. People don't do... Uh, political movements based on the past, on respecting origins, finding oppressions, recognizing how a past has led to our oppression in the, in the present, to say in the future something will happen about it. You do it so that the present becomes the moment of something to be done. Right? So it's still a matter of expectation and projecting that expectation onto the present where the present is the ultimate aim. Don't expect anything from the future. You're not going to say one day things will change. You say they need to change now, right? So it's like you divide the future. The future is the moment where something different will happen, and it's also where you put your expectation. So you put the expectation on the past, and something happening on the present, so decompose it. But I think that's a very interesting thing that the seventies were also the beginning of philosophers, usually uh, interested in, in psychoanalysis for one reason or another, who said, well. The great thing about psychoanalysis is not that it says that the past is the cause of the present and has some enigmatic thing that if we learn about it, we can change the now. It's that actually that the now is so broken that you usually go to the past to try to explain why it's broken. So you go to your childhood to stay, I mean, if you ever watched one of those terrible TV shows like Obsessed, have you seen this? Like people with terrible pathologies like herders and people who eat pieces of the wall crazy things like this. So normally, it's amazing that the person does something like really crazy you would never want to show on TV, to, to be honest, I don't know why they want. That's part of the pathology, I think. You <laughs> want to show it on TV. And then they have a perfect story. Like, why are you eating a piece of the drywall? When I was a kid, <laughs> my father did this and that, and that's why I'm like this. So, actually, what they do here is the big incognito. They go to the past and they explain it away. That's what we kind of explain on psychoanalysis, right? Ah, you, you're doing this really crazy thing, but that's because when you were a kid, in fact, this and that happened. But this is what Freud believed for like two years of his practice. There's a very famous text where he says, you know, if I were to believe my patients, what they say about the patient, the past, the, all the nannies would have abused all the patients <laughs> in Vienna. Like we met to lock all the, ba the nannies in Vienna because everyone tells a story where, no, I do this, I want this really perverted thing. I don't, don't really want why, know why I want it, because when I was a kid, my nanny did something to me. Sometimes they didn't even have nannies. <laughs> you know, they, it's always like, that's, that's interesting how that happened. So it's not really a matter of that the past causes something. But psychoanalysis had an idea that the present is itself the place where indeterminate, unexperienced things happen. That's the idea of the unconscious. You think you're experiencing this, but you're experiencing something else, right? So that thing that we said that was definitive of the future, the idea that the future is the place of the unexperienced. For psychoanalysis, the present is the place of the unexperienced. You're doing things that you don't know what you're, why you're doing. So it's interesting that in the 70s, a bunch of philosophers started to look at psychoanalysis for a model of how to think the present as the place where events happen, or happen at the edge of the present. Like, things can happen to you now, that you cannot explain what they are. 
they're not comforting properly. So for example, there is this famous philosopher called Alabadiu, who says, well, events happened here. For example, you're walking down the street, you meet someone. It's very funny because it's a very different concept of events than the idea of a future event. If event happened in your space of, in your horizon of expectation, you would know when they happen, like something very weird coming towards you, you know, like my life is this way, something else is happening. But events that happen in your experience space, events that happen within the space of things you already know, they don't even appear like events. You're walking down the street or you go to a bar and you meet a nice person. You don't know if that's going to change your life or not. But deciding that, that this was very important, this is part of what makes it look like it's up to you to turn that into an event in a certain way. So if here is something that when it happens to you, like an alien ship landing, which is one of the few things we're still allowed to imagine for the future. <laughs> uh, if, a, if an alien ship lands, man, I think you're going to know. Like, you know, though, though there are a lot of good movies that says that even that you would know, like Invasion of the Body is natural, right? Uh, but the fact is that the funny thing about events that happen in the present is that it's not that they tell you something new arrived. It's more about those moments that you're in doubt. Like, is this something new? Like you're, you're convened to decide if something happens to you. So there's a bunch of philosophers who said, well, we need to think politically how to invert the order, to find, like, to find a way to talk about those experiences in the present that are not exactly experiences. They already in the present take you a bit outside of your place. But just a bit, it's hard to talk about it. Like, you're living your life, you have a plan for your life, you're going to go to this university, move to this place, and then you meet somebody, you cannot go to that place. So then you're like, you might have a choice, but it's not that this is going to impose on you. You shouldn't move because you've got a girl. You're the one who's going to turn this into such an important thing that it has a power to change your direction. Well, I didn't move that because my girlfriend couldn't move. But if you were to say, no, of course, my, well, I need to do this, this is my place, I need to become this teacher, and unfortunately this relationship cannot hold in this situation. Nothing's going to distinguish if that's an event that's going to change the course of your life, or if it's just, you know, something that can exist while you're keeping in your place. So it's a very subtle distinction. So how do you talk about the subtle things that already take you out of your space of experience, within your experience, and how do you talk about constructing something towards the future? that it's rather a matter of trusting this, it's a matter of using the stuff in the present to, to construct this place. So how do you construct something like this? Right, so that other people can perhaps put their expectations on you. Right, they look at this political organization, they look at this writer, this sci-fi writer, for example, they say, this thing is not just unreal, this thing, you know, this teaches me how to imagine. So it's funny because it turns around. Rather than, than having to use imagination, you need to teach, learn how to imagine. And rather than waiting for events, you need to learn how to recognize this, these things, right? So I'm not sure if this answers your question, but it has to. Uh, it. it does, but I have to run outside to get uh, lunch. So. Uh, I have a question, sir. Oh, okay. okay. Um, when you mentioned the metaphor of the body for you know political economic organization. Um, you also mentioned Agamben, and I was wondering if you thought that his idea of biopolitics is any in any way like a, a modern day metaphor for yes, the body. Yeah, I really in the political, political sphere. Yeah, but now you need to ask the following question: like this, that that moment we talked about. So it's around here. This is the turning point, right? Mm -hmm. From here to all this modern thing. Is this a metaphor? When you say labor is that part of our daily activities that gives us some sort of coordinating power to talk about the whole. Are you talking about a metaphor? Because your actual body is at stake. Oh yeah, yeah. I think so. Part part of what I wrote down was maybe, maybe not a metaphor, but that instead of some direct metaphor, now we have things like biopolitics. So it's still a body which is driving political decisions and things like that, but it's no longer in a metaphorical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly the point. I think a good way of seeing the shift is that before, the idea was that it's not your actual physical body that is the point where you see where things are in a bigger picture. But now, it, it's, rather than being this glorious, sublime body, you, it is itself within your finite, stupid 
physical body, and that's the actual concrete thing we supposedly can track. It's a funny thing, the idea of security is a good example of this. When people say life is sacred, so every citizen should be safe. What are they protecting? Are they protecting your physical body? But they're saying that you need to protect it because of life. So the fact that you're alive is an idea so high that it serves as a reason to coordinate the whole society. It's funny because political economy would say subsistence, perhaps you need to survive. But sometimes the idea rather than survival, we'll talk today about security. Perhaps more safe to talk about security because we're not sure about survival. <laughs> we are secure, but we're not living. But uh, definitely what I, what I jump at is tracking with that. And that's why he goes to political theology, because he thinks that the Foucaultian idea of biopolitics is actually a consequence of that whole debate with very theological roots in Christianity about politics. So he goes through the Christian incarnation, the idea of the king's two bodies, to get a sort of genealogy of this biopolitical discourse of let's keep people's bodies safe. You need to own your own body. You need to feel at home in your body. The idea that the society is all the more stable, the more your physical existence is stable. So you pathologize anomalies in the way that you relate to your body. You tend to look with suspicion to people who don't relate to their bodies as something important. Or the people put their by smoking. <laughs> if you, you see, drugs which give you the idea that you have a better connection to your body are more ideologically acceptable than those who just seem to kind of destroy your body. Like, why are you destroying yourself? It's very much like protecting people. There's definitely a biopolitics of smoking. Uh, so that, I think it's totally, totally connected. Mm -hmm. Evidently, I stole most of this from him. So <laughs> there's a very good reason why it's connected. But uh, uh, the, what, what I think is good, perhaps it's not very clear in Agamben, is that, well, but don't even, calling it biopolitics is a bit deceiving because the political economy was always about this, about life, about survival, about how you reproduce until tomorrow, the relation between staying alive and the political body staying alive, right? So sometimes when you talk about a shift towards biopolitics,